good. Are you done? Good. Pretty good. Okay, you sent me three documents, is that right? Yeah. The first two that I sent you was a quiz that I didn't do well on at all. I don't think I was focused in the class whatsoever. I just kind of zoned out the other day. So. Well, here, here are some thoughts. I, I looked at this one, and I saw you didn't do very well. And some of the thoughts I had were, if we're always covering these after the crime, are we doing you the most amount of good? Um, actually, yes, because um, this is like the kind of stuff that's going to be on the test. Okay. So okay. it prepares me for the okay. question that I'm not doing well on. Okay. Um, my idea was thinking that if we could get ahead of this somehow, instead, okay. of, instead of always behind it, mm -hmm. in other words, if we're always going over the quizzes where you've missed problems, I mean, that's certainly a good thing to review if you have to take a test on it again. Right. But in terms of doing good on the quizzes, if we could somehow get ahead of it, that would be the optimum way because – Okay. Then you do good on the quizzes, and presumably you'd still do good on the tests. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so I'm not totally next, sure how to do that, how, yeah, to, get, next how to get ahead. I, Go ahead. Yeah. Um, next week I can, um, like, get the book and, like, flip through the chapter and take pictures of some of the problems. I. That sounds uh, like a good idea. That sounds like The good. third... Yeah, the third picture that I sent you was a picture I got from a friend of, like, I just asked her to send me, like, okay. two problems of, like, a word problem. So, uh, okay, good. So she did that for me, but. Well, we can certainly go over that. What's okay. the definition of a rational number? An irrational or rational? Either one. What's a rational number? Rational number is um, like our numbers that can be written as fractions. That's and it. That's all you need to know. Nothing okay. else. That is the definition of rational. In other words, two is rational, three-fourths is rational, one-third is rational. Pi is not because pi you cannot write as a fraction. Right. You can approximate it as a decimal, but it goes on forever. So you, there's no way to write the pi as a fraction. So it's not rational. And all square roots that do not produce an integer are irrational. That's irrational. Okay. Square root of 25 is not, because that's equal to 5, which can be written as a fraction, 5 over 1. Okay, so um, irrational numbers are numbers, numbers that... Write as a fraction. That is all you have to memorize. Okay. If you can write a number as a fraction, it is rational. If you cannot, it is irrational. I can write that as a fraction... 2 over 1, if you like. I can write that as a fraction. I can write that as a fraction. I cannot write that as a fraction, square root of 2. Okay. And in fact, it turns out that any root that is not a perfect root is irrational. In other okay. words, square root of 3 is irrational, square root of 5 is irrational, square root of 6 is irrational, square root of 7, square root of 8. Square root of 9 can be written as 3, so it's rational. Square mm -hmm. root of 10, well, I could write square root of 10 as square root of 5 times square root of 2, but both of those are irrational, and their product is irrational. Okay. So square root of 10. And, and, and just, just know that unless you can reduce that to a whole number, it is irrational. Okay. Cube root of 8, that's equal to 2. That's rational. Okay. 
Cube root of 9, irrational. Okay. Because there's no whole number that multiplies 3 times to give you 9. Okay. okay, so that's the definition of rational and irrational, and it's really rather straightforward. But most of the times, roots, anytime you see a radical sign, it's probably going to be irrational. All right. Okay, so that's certainly irrational because you cannot write square root of 10 as a fraction. Okay. I think I just got those two mixed up in my head. <laughs> yeah. Um, dividing by polynomials. Mm -hmm. This is basically, hold on, keep doing the same mistake. This is long division. Right. I think I started doing that and then I just well, gave up. It's pretty, it's pretty easy actually with long division. Put that on the outside. Mm -hmm. The trick is to make sure you have every degree of polynomial represented. And notice what's missing. There's no x squared term. Right. So I have to put it in with a zero coefficient. Okay. There is an x term. And there is a constant. So, now what do I do? Uh, the first step when you're dividing by a polynomial into a polynomial is always divide that term into that term. Right. How many times does 2x go into 8x cubed? Uh, 4x squared. Okay. And now the next step is to multiply the 4x squared by both terms. Okay. And you're always going to get the same term there, right? Otherwise, it, mm -hmm. in other words, if that divides into that, that, then that times that term is going to be the same term. But now you right. only have to multiply that by the minus 1. So it's minus 4x squared. Now, when you're doing long division, you're always subtracting. Mm -hmm. As opposed to synthetic division, where you're always adding. Right. So if I'm subtracting here, what is, I, I know that's zero, mm -hmm. but what is the next term? Uh, that'd be negative 4x squared. Think of what we're doing. We've got 0x squared minus a negative 4x squared. Remember, we are always subtracting. Oh. Right, okay, so that'd be positive, or plus 4x squared. Correct. And now, bring down the next term, just like with long division, and repeat. In other words, no matter how big your polynomial that you're dividing into is, this may be a 10-step problem. It may be a two-step problem. Just every single step is the same as before. So what's the first thing I need to do there? You need to um, do, like, you need to, I don't know how to put it in right terms, but. No, I want to divide 4x squared by 2x. Right. And that's all. And in other words, all I'm doing is dividing that into that. Right. Ignore the negative 1 and the plus 6x for this first step. Okay, what is 4x squared divided by 2x? 2x. Plus 2x. <clears throat> Notice I do need the plus. I cannot ignore it, even though, you know, typically you wouldn't put it in. But when I'm giving you the answer to this division, I need it. Mm -hmm. Now what? And then you multiply 2x by negative 1. Start from the left. Multiply 2x by the 2x. Oh, yeah, so 4x squared minus 
two X. No. And that would be eight X. Correct. And then minus five. And then that would be plus four. Yeah. And now keep going. And that would be let's say negative minus four. Hold on. Next step is going to be to multiply that by these two terms. Right. Okay. So that would be four x. Always going to be the same uh, yeah. as that number. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. notice that this was the same as that. This was the same as that. And that's because we got that thing above the radical sign by dividing that into that. So it has to be the same. If it's not the same, we've made a mistake. Right. Well, the very first part we know is 8x. Right. Okay. So 8x, the and then you multiply 4 by negative 1, and that's negative 4. Okay, now subtract again. And that would be negative 1. Now what? Um... Now I can no longer divide 2x into negative 1. Right. That means that's the remainder. Right. Okay. So the full and complete answer is minus 1 divided by whatever that is. Two, okay. 2x minus 1. And that's your complete answer. And we could prove it if we wanted to take the time by now multiplying that whole thing by that whole thing. And we better get that. In other words, okay. division is the inverse of multiplication. So if I divide 8 by 2 and I get 4, then 4 times 2 better be 8. Right. So every time you're dividing, the answer you get, you better be able to multiply back and get your original thing that's under the radical sign. But that's basically the way you do it. And the trickiest part is making sure you put in these ghost variables or these ghost coefficients, I should call them. Right. Because if you leave out this 0x squared, it really mm -hmm. throws everything for a loop. Right. I think, like, that's definitely the part. Because I did start doing that. I erased it on there because I just got totally confused. I can see my marks on there that I started doing the long division like this. Okay. But then I didn't know what to do because I couldn't get an x squared. Okay. Right. Right. If you leave out the dummy variable, it's not. It's going to throw you completely. Never come out right. I notice one thing you do up here is you try to cancel the eight, the six, and the two right away. Okay. Yeah. You cannot do that. Not when you have this constant being added. Okay. In other words, I cannot divide the top by two, which is right. good. Or the bottom by 2. I mean, I could, right. but it would leave a minus 5 halves there, and it would leave a minus 1 half there. So you don't want to do it. If I could okay. divide the top by a, a some number, if I could factor out a greatest common factor, well, yes, go ahead and do that. But you're never going to be able to. You're never going to be able to do that in these kind of problems. They just don't set them up that way. This right. is a straight long division problem that you have to be aware of putting those dummy variables in. Right. All right. And then on this one, on number three, I just totally forgot what polynomials were. Okay. So... Well, polynomials are some combination of x 
to some exponent plus mm -hmm. or minus other x's to some exponent. Right. Okay, so this is called a fourth degree polynomial because the highest x exponent is 4. Right. So you got that. What's the leading coefficient of the polynomial? Well, is all that means is what's the coefficient of that highest degree? Okay. That's right. be 12. Yeah. In other words, the leading coefficient, read those words. In other words, the degree is x to the fourth, but the coefficient is always the number that's in front of that. Okay. Okay. What's the coefficient of the term degree x squared? Um. Notice there is no term x squared, right? So if I had to write this polynomial with an x squared, what would its coefficient be? Um, it would be zero. Correct. That's the leading coefficient of the x squared term is zero. Okay. Okay. If it's not there and you want to put it in, it would be zero. What's the degree of the last term in the polynomial? Now, this doesn't ask you what the coefficient is. Right. Right? The difference between coefficient, the coefficient is the number in front. The degree is the exponent of the x term. Right. Okay. Um, there's another way to write a minus 11. How about if I write a minus 11 this way? That would be zero. Correct. And that's why her answer is zero. Because the last term is a constant, but another way to think about a constant is it's being multiplied by x to the zeroth. In other words, any number raised to the zeroth power is 1. Right. So if I really wanted to, Two, I could write this as this way. And now okay. notice that when I've written it that way, I have allowed for every single degree of exponent. From 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Right. Just that we don't ever write that because that always is the number 1. Right. Back to the problem we had last time is why is 0 to the 0th power indeterminate? If x to the 0th power is always 1, then 0 to the 0th power is always 1, and it is. So I've never seen a case where it's actually indeterminate. It's always 1. And this problem just kind of supports that. Right. In other words, if they insist upon putting an x with this minus 11, it's got to be x to the zeroth power. Okay, that makes sense. That's a good trick. Okay, and I always, on number 4, uh -huh. is going over it, and I get expression and equation. Completely confused. <laughs> When the last time we talked about word problems, you'll notice that I did most of them as two variable problems. Right. And then you came back to me and you said your teacher really kind of wanted you to do them as one variable problems. Right. Well, a lot of problems, you do have a choice to do them as either one variable or two variable. And the key is whether you can figure out how to get the second variable. In other words, mm -hmm. the last question, what expression do we use to represent the amount of money invested in the other account? Mm -hmm. Well, they're basically saying you have 12000 to invest in two accounts. So I have two ways to do it. I could say X is the amount invested in the first, and Y is the amount invested in the second, 
But there's another way to express y without introducing a second variable. What is it? Um, wouldn't it be the total amount minus x? 12,000 minus x. 12,000 minus x. Instead of using a second variable y, we're just going to call this. We know the total is 12,000. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to say is the amount invested in the second account. In other words, if you were to put 4,000 in the first account, mm -hmm. that would leave 8,000 for the second account. So whenever you have a problem like this, Taryn, I, I would like to see kind of a process where you use some numbers to verify these things. Okay. In other words, make up a real-life situation where you have 12,000 and you're going to put it into two different accounts. Well, if you put 3K in the first account, that leaves 9K for the second account. Well, how'd you get 9K? You subtracted the initial amount from 12,000. Okay. Okay. So you kind of want to start thinking like this. You don't really have to. In other words, there's nothing wrong with solving this as a two-variable problem. But notice what your second variable would be. If I were to let that be y, my second variable is going to be, or one of my equations is going to be this, right? Mm -hmm. Well, which means y is equal to 12,000 minus x. Right. So I basically am right, I'm using two variables, but I'm solving one of the equations immediately mm -hmm. so that I do not have to use it as a two-variable problem. Right. And this one is forcing you to use the same variable because they don't even ask you to solve the problem. They merely ask you to define the expression we would use for the amount of money in the other account. Well, right. that's 12,000 minus X. Okay. And it's not an equation. That's why she said you gave an equation. An equation always has an equal sign. Right, okay. We don't have an equal sign here. And the reason we don't is that they didn't tell us how much one account paid in interest or the other account or how much interest was earned over a period of time. Had they said any of that, we could have written an equation. But right. the only thing they want is an expression which never has an equal sign. Okay. And the expression is 12,000 minus X. Okay. Okay. That's starting to make sense. And there really is not an equation that we can write except at this point in time, if they said what equation applies to this problem, well, what would it be? It would be X plus 12,000 minus X has to equal 12,000. In other words, the sum of the two amounts that were invested have to equal 12,000. Well, if you, if you do this algebra, you get 12,000 equals 12,000. Right. Okay. So that's the only equation we would really be able to write with the information they've given us. Okay. I see where I went wrong on that. I think he only took off one point of that because... For the previous one or this one? Yeah. Um, okay, let me, number see. Five. let me see what you've done here. Okay, you distributed. Then... Yeah. Show all work. In other words, he did not want you to go from this step to this step. Okay. Okay. The reason he didn't is because he wanted you to show the intermediate step. In other words, remove the parentheses. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty picky. I mean, that's worse than your high school teacher was. 
Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> Seriously. Although, notice the one difference. When you remove these parentheses, this plus 4 turns into a minus 4, and that's very, very important. Oh, uh, so, yeah. See, like, I'm used to just doing that in my head because well, my high school and you, really did it, you did it uh, properly because you ended up getting x minus 7, whereas if you'd have left that as a plus 4, you'd have never gotten x minus 7 over here. Right. And then equals x minus 7. And she didn't really take off one point for the lack of this middle line. Mm -hmm. Looks like she did, but she didn't. Okay. If if you solve this equation and you get x minus 7 equals x minus 7, well, now I can add 7 to both sides. What does that mean? It means that. x equal x. What does it mean for a solution for x? In other words, remember that we started with an equation in x we're trying to figure out what x is. Right. When you get x equal x, what is x? It could be anything. Anything, exactly. In other words, this is a true equation no matter what x is. I could make x anything from negative infinity to positive infinity, and this equation is going to be true. In other words, there's not just one solution for x. There's an infinite number of solutions. Right. Okay. Okay. This math teacher is picky. <laughs> well, yes and no. Uh, she's picky for putting in this middle line, but not really, because the common mistake, the most common mistake that your classmates would make here would be to leave that as plus 4 after removing the parentheses. So removing the parentheses is not trivial here, but I don't think that's why she took off a point. I think she took off a point because she didn't finish the problem. Once we get right. this step here, we still need to solve for x. So you still have to come to the conclusion that x can be all reals. Gotcha. Okay, setting up an inequality and then solve. Setting up an inequality is pretty much the same as setting up an equation. It's not that different. The only difference is instead of having an equal sign, you're going to have a less than or greater than or less than or equal sign. Okay. So, you're a member at this golf club. Cost you $120 per month plus each round costs $35. How many rounds can you play? What's the first step? Um... What's Identify always, the unknowns. <laughs> what's always the first step? Set up your variable and define it. Right. What's x going to be? x is going to be how many rounds of golf? You can play in the month. Oh, okay. Okay, because that's what the question says. How many rounds of golf can a member play per month at most? So okay. the number of rounds per month. Let's spell it out to that much detail. Okay. okay. Well, what's it cost us to play? In other words, if we're going we're gonna to have a, either an equation or an inequality, mm -hmm. the left side is going to be the cost to play okay. in a given month. What's the cost going to be? In other words, let's say it's an equation. Okay. Just for practice. 
What's the left side of this equation? What's the cost? Based uh, on the variable. Uh, $270? No, hold on. Forget, oh. forget that for a moment. Oh, 120. Plus what? In other words, 120 does not let us play an unlimited amount of rounds. It just is the initial cost. We're going to pay 120 whether we play any rounds or not. I've belonged to a country club, I know. And it wasn't 120, it was 500 per month. Oh, geez. Then you also played or paid for each round of golf you played. So you do 120 plus 35? 35 what? Don't forget uh, the variable. There's round, a, so X. There's always a variable. You don't have a variable, you're missing something. Okay? Right. So this is the cost for me to play during a given month. So okay. now this is not an equation, it's an inequality. So what mm -hmm. have, what's the rest of it got to be? So it would be... He has to keep his cost at $270 at most. Greater than or equal to, or less than or equal to? Less than or equal to. Two seconds. And that's exactly going to work. In other words, if he were to play four rounds of golf, this would equal 140, this would equal 120, that total would be 260. Okay. Okay, let's solve it. That's our inequality, for sure. Mm -hmm. well, how do I solve that? You're going to subtract 120 from both sides. So you're going to be left with 35x on the left and greater than or equal to um, 150. Okay, keep going. And then you're going to divide by 35 on both sides. And 4.2. I don't know if it's 4. It's either 4.1 and change or 4.2. Doesn't matter because what is true about X has, uh, to, be, has to be an integer. Right. You can't play a part of a round. Right. So what does X have to be? Less than or equal to? Right, okay. Has to be less than or equal to 4. Okay, okay. So you round. You cannot play 5 rounds. 5 rounds would run you 290 or 295. Right. And you cannot exceed 270, so you can only play 4 rounds. Okay. Okay. But okay. the key is it's very much similar to setting up equations, very much. You define your variable. You set up what the cost is per month. It's 120 plus $35 times the number of rounds you play in that month. And then all it says is it has to be less than or equal because it says at most, which is less than or equal the amount they give you. And then you just solve that inequality. Once you get a solution, you do have to make one further leap here, which is to know that X has to be a whole number. Can't be a partial number because you're playing rounds of golf. Okay. Okay. All right, what's the first step on the last one? All right, let's see. You want to identify your variables first. <laughs> so how many miles driven on one day costs? Okay, so, what so X, X would equal the cost... No. Um, oh. No. Always. Miles. Right. <laughs> Look at this question. Look at those three words right there. 
That tells you what your variable is. Okay, not, so not that. Right. How, how many miles? That's what you want to look at. How many miles? So X has to be the number of miles. Okay. In one day. And we can write that if we want. We're probably not going to actually need that. You could get the problem right if you didn't write that. But I'm a firm believer in spelling out your variables precisely because there are some problems where if you don't spell it out precisely, it can get confusing. Okay. Now, okay. what's the cost on the left side of this inequality or equation? So, what does the left side have to be? And the left so side is always going to be our cost. Right. Okay. So, so how can we write the cost in terms of X and the other information they've given us? It'd be 95 plus um, 6.65 X and then... Now X. look at the last sentence. We have to keep it at no more than 120. So less than or equal to? One twenty. Okay. okay. Now now it's piece of cake. In other words, now you've pretty much done all the work. What's the next right. step here? You subtract ninety five from both sides. And that would be twenty five. And then you divide by point sixty five. And then the X it's 38.461, so. All right, so hold on a second. How many miles can be driven in a one-day rental? Ooh. Now, this is slightly different. Mm hmm Because you can drive a part of a mile. Right. <laughs> actually play a part of a golf round also. But... In their question regarding golf rounds, I'm pretty sure they meant for you to only be able to play one, you know, in integer number of golf rounds. Whereas right. this might be a little different. In other words, I don't know if their answer should be X has to be less than or equal to 38 or X has to be less than or equal to that. Because you I certainly... Think he would want us to, like, round it. To what? To how many? In other words, he doesn't say in the question. Right. I mean, since well, you can... But there are some cases where you would want to give it as a decimal, but there's others where you would not. Quite certain with question 91, the answer is 4. Not, right. Not 4.2. Because people don't tend to play partial rounds of golf. Right. But people do tend to drive parts of miles. Right. So it's possible that in 92, he wants a decimal answer. And if he does, he has to give you instructions as to how to round it off. And he didn't do right. that. So I don't know if it's 38.46 or 38.4, whatever the rest of the decimals are. Uh, or 38. It could be 38. I just don't know. Given the fact that he did not give instructions about rounding it to some nearest decimal, mm -hmm. I'm thinking maybe the answer might be just 38. Because if it was 38 with a decimal, he would have given us instructions, round it off. How many right. miles can be driven? Yeah, that's, a, that's a typo. That's a bad problem is what it is. Yeah. It's not a bad problem. It's an ambiguous problem. In other words, right. it doesn't, it's not clear as to precisely what it is wanting for an answer. Is it wanting it in whole miles, or is it wanting it in miles to the nearest hundredths place, or what? But so 
I just have a quick question with like um like graphing inequalities like for I always get this confused for give me give me one than less than on like if I were to draw it like graph it um would that be an open circle or a closed circle here let me give you some Okay. Open, okay, so that would be open, open circle, circle, right? X greater than or equal to four. Close. Okay. The only difference. Open circles go with just the inequality. Closed circles go with the inequality and an equal sign. Okay. That's what I always get confused on. Okay. The graph. But in terms of graphing, let, let's uh, let me make sure I. If I had this equation, and I turn it into an inequality, and I say graph that. Well, the first thing you do is you draw it as an equation, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I know it goes through this point, has a slope of one. Now the only question I have to decide is, is it a straight line or is it a dotted line? What, okay. should, what should it be? Um, that should be a dotted line. Correct. In other words, the difference between a dotted line and a straight line is the same difference between an open circle and a closed circle. In other words, dotted lines go with this. Straight lines go with greater than or equal. Now, there's oh. only one last question here, and that's which side of that dotted line do you shade? You would shade uh, greater than, so it would be in the first quadrant above the line? No, the only thing you want to look at is the y-axis. Uh, the only thing. Forget measurements like that. Okay. Those are not pertinent. It's y that has to be greater than this line. That dotted line is that side of the equality. <clears throat> so if y has to be greater, we're going to go to the y-axis. We're going to find okay. a point on that y-axis that is above that line. Well, there's a point. That tells me which side to shape. Okay. That's always it. In other words, okay, if I had that. this problem, Which shot side do I shade? And don't say left or right. Because that means you're thinking in terms of this. Mm -hmm. You want to be thinking in terms of up or down. Right. So which side of this equation or inequality would I shade? And it would be a dotted line. Well, let me make it like this. Um, you'd want to shade. This always messes me up. Well, uh, look to the y-axis only. The reason okay. it messes you up is because you're confusing left and right with up and down. Right. When it's y over here, we're always talking up and down. So we find our line, we find the y-axis, we need to be above that line. So there's a point on the y-axis that is above that line. Okay. And that tells us this is where we shade. Okay, that makes sense. And it looks like it's the left side, but it's not really. It's the okay. above side. In other words, if I change this slightly and put a negative sign there, 
So mm -hmm. my graph now looks like this. Well, which side do I shade? I look to the y-axis. It's still greater than. In other words, y has to be greater than this line. There's a point that's greater mm -hmm. than that line. Okay. So just try not to think in terms of left and right, no matter what the shape of the curve is. Okay. Just find a point on the y-axis that is either above or below, depending on what that is. Mm -hmm. Put a dot there and shade that side of the line. It's as simple as that. Okay, that makes so much more sense now. Okay. All right. Um, Any other questions, Taryn? Um, yeah. Um, another thing is with when I think it's called like a what's the name for that? It's like a compound inequality. I think it's called where you use the brackets or the parentheses on a graph. Does that make sense? Or I'm trying to figure out what you're referring to. Um, um, you it's have a specific like, problem, do you? Um, I do. Um, okay. X is less than or greater to negative 4. Ooh, less and than or greater to. That would come out like that, which doesn't make any sense. I meant I mean, less, less than, than or equal to. Okay, 4. Or negative four. Negative four. Okay, so that's and one. It's one inequality. And then there's a U shape in between. Is it defined by an equation? Um, it's the yeah, it's like an intersection is what they call it. It's like a U. <laughs> I don't like a parabola. Yeah, between the equations. Okay, let's let's start with the x is less than or equal to minus four. But this is like this is just like a straight line. It's not like um, coordinate points. There's the know. graph of that. Okay. Now, when you say there's a u, does that mean that there's a parabola? In other words, a second inequality that is part of this problem? Let me, I can send you a quick picture of my Okay. notes okay. really fast. Yeah, go ahead and do that. It's kind of hard to describe when you can't see it. Ah, uh, you. I know what your you is. Your you is this in conjunction with. Yeah, <laughs> that's the, the word. X greater than five. Okay. How would I graph that? There's zero. Uh, there's minus four. I know that x has to be less than or equal to minus 4 or greater than 5. Okay. That's how I would graph that particular expression. Let me look, okay. at, and then, let me look at your problem um, real quick here. Yeah, it's when... Like when you use like a bracket or a parenthesis. Use a bracket when it can be that number. You use a parenthesis when it is everything up to that number. Okay. Hold on, I'll. They're kind of messy, but. All right. Yeah. Um, let's see. This graph is very good. In other words, 
bracket has the, you don't really use a bracket on the graph. You okay. Use the closed dot. Same, okay. same thing as a bracket. Okay. The problem is where you've drawn the bracket is not at negative four. It's someplace to the right of that. So it doesn't really make sense to put the bracket on the graph. Okay, so like for example, so like for the bracket, it's the closed dot. And then in place yeah. of the open dot, or in place of the parentheses, it's the open dot. Now, there's interval notation, which is what it sounds like you're talking about. When you are using interval notation, in other words, if I want to take that expression and put it in interval notation, then I need brackets or parentheses. Okay. okay. It would be interval notation would be minus infinity up to negative 4 with a bracket because it can be equal to negative 4. Okay. In combination with greater than 11. Well, that means it cannot be 11, but it can be greater than 11. So this would be interval notation expressing this statement right here. Okay. Okay. And, and this interval notation is the same thing as what you've graphed, only um, you don't <laughs> use the bracket or the parentheses on the graph. Just erase those and you, this would be perfect. And so would this. In other words, you didn't use parentheses or brackets here. Yeah. You weren't supposed See, to. He kind of, he puts like those, I copy everything that he puts on the board. Mm -hmm. And he just said like that helps us like remember if okay. we're doing an interval notation. Well, so you some... always remember that parentheses go with either the greater than or less than. And brackets go with the number that it can be. In other words, this statement says that x could actually be minus 4, right? Right. So we have a closed dot there. And in interval notation, we have a bracket next to the minus 4. Okay. But it okay. also says that x could be greater than 11, but it cannot be equal to 11. It has to be greater than 11. Well, that means open dot here, no parentheses in the graph. But if we're going to write the interval notation, next to the 11 goes a parentheses, not a bracket. Okay. And infinities always have parentheses, never a bracket. The reason is, is that infinity is not a number. Okay. There is no number infinity. So... The bracket means it can be that number. So it would never make sense to put a bracket next to an infinity. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Okay, this is set notation. Remember that from the very first session we had? Yeah. And the only thing missing from your set notation here is the X. Oh, right. In other words, you need x such that x is less than or equal to negative 4 in combination with x greater than 11. This is perfect, only you need another x right there. In other words, this, yeah. this first x merely tells you that, I don't know, it's just they write it, whatever the variable is, they put it to the left of this vertical line. But the rest of it has to read kind of like this. In fact, exactly like that. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. And you're going to have problems where you're graphing inequalities. Okay. So let's say I have a couple of inequalities. So let's say I have an inequality that's defined by that line and y is greater than that inequality. So I'm shading that part there. And maybe I have another inequality that is this 
line. Okay. Only in my second inequality, it's y is less than. So what I would be shading would be everything there. Well, your solution set is the area where you have both shadings. Okay. It got erased because whenever I do this, it thinks I'm trying to erase something. <laughs> so when you have compound inequalities that you're trying to graph, you just, okay. when you shade, Use stripes for one of them and stripes this way for another. And then whatever part of the graph where you have overlapping stripes, that's your solution set. Okay. Okay. That helps tremendously. <laughs> okay. Any other last questions, or are you good to go? I think I'm set. Uh, all that we did today definitely helps clear up some good. questions. Good. I wish we could have gotten this material in advance of your quiz. You'd have done a lot better on your quiz. Yeah, most definitely. And let me just reemphasize that. The more we can work in advance as opposed to in rears, the better off you're going to be. Because I understand that you're going to have to face these problems again on the final. But right. the final isn't going to be for a couple of months. Right. So. Yeah. And the thing that's hard is like he doesn't like giving study guides for a test either. Okay. So. so when it comes time to prepare for your final, the only thing we're going to have are all these quizzes. Which right. at least is better than high school. Remember at Chatfield or uh, Dakota Ridge, I can't remember which one you went to. But Dakota, yeah. Yeah, I thought you went to Dakota. They don't give out your quizzes back to you. So when they're preparing you for a final, they have no choice but to give you review material. But right. at college, it's liable to be different because he does give you your quizzes back. So he figures that you don't need any review material. Just review all your quizzes. So right. make sure you keep all of these, and I'll, I'll try to, you know, I might be able to keep them. I, yeah, there's no way they're going to disappear. <laughs> so when it comes time to preparing for your semester exam, we'll be able to go back over these quizzes. But even right. still, if there was any way you could get ahead of the curve instead of slightly behind it always, your grade's going to end up much better. I mean, surely these quizzes have a, effect on your grade, do they not? Don't they count a certain percentage? What? I'm sorry? Do these quizzes count towards your final grade? Uh, yes. For So far, um, we take these quizzes um, at the beginning of class every day, and um, we have 10 minutes to do them, which is kind of difficult sometimes. Okay. Um, but we take them every day, and that's how we keep our like we as or calculate our average okay. until we take an exam, and then he like so these we quizzes, they, average quizzes our are going to be important. And if there's any way we could get ahead of them, you're going to benefit a lot from that. Right. I mean, you're going to benefit a little bit from reviewing them after the fact, but you're going to suffer the the poor scores on them also. Right. So if we could get ahead of them a little bit, you might do a little bit better on the quizzes. Right. Yeah. All right. I'll let you work that out. However, you, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with Tuesday and Thursday. But I have a feeling that's probably why your dad wanted to add a third hour, is just yeah. so we could maybe get you ahead of the game. I have quite a few students, and not very many of them. Only about 10% of my students are able to actually get ahead of the game and not behind it. And they are always my best students. They're the ones that get the A's and the B's. Because mm -hmm. they get ahead of it, and then when they have the class on that section, they understand it more. 
they, you know, they understand what the teacher's talking about because we've had a chance to talk about it. So ahead of it works so much better than behind. Right. Okay. Okay. I'll definitely for Tuesday next week um, pull some of my notes together and okay. we can work on those because on Tuesdays and Thursdays with our sessions it's right before my math class because my math class is at 5:30. Perfect. So it, I get a review yeah. right before the quiz, and so. Okay. Okay. Good. So that's the reviews we should be going over. Ideally. Right. Are the okay. reviews of the quiz that's coming that day? Yeah, and like sometimes when I just like we go over just the quizzes like we have for the past few sessions, uh -huh. it's because he sometimes puts the material from the previous quiz on the next quiz. Yeah, yeah, you're going to be limited a little bit as to how efficiently we can do this, but um, right. the general idea is to try to stay ahead, not always working from behind. Right. All right. Karen, I'm going to talk to you next Tuesday. Sounds good. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye-bye.